148. Alleluia, all you heavens praise God. All you creatures in the heavens, sun and moon, all stars of light, all you waters above the heavens, let the glory of praise resound. All loveliness comes from God, who made creation never to pass away. Praise God, O earth, sea, creatures of all waters, lightning and hail, snow and mist, stormy winds and rain, all you who fulfill God's word, give praise. All hills and mountain peaks, valleys and plains, orchards and forests, beasts wild and tame, all reptiles and birds on wing, let the glory of praise resound. Leaders of the earth and every nation, young women and men, the elders with the young, all you who live on earth, give praise. Let God be praised. Let God alone be praised. The splendor of his holy name reaches beyond earth and sky. God is the strength of all the faithful, of all who draw near. Hearts will be comforted, spirits renewed. To the Holy One of blessing, glory, and praise. I welcome you to this uh, session of our Cosmos and Creation Conference, and I uh, let me mention that, uh, the, for those who are new here, uh, the conference, um, Cosmos and Creation Conference has been founded over 30 years ago by Father Sim, uh, Jim Salmon, uh, who taught in the theology and in the chemistry department of Loyola University. And uh, at this year's commencement um, exercises, he received the uh, Newman Medal for his achievements in uh, Christian education. And certainly the Cosmos and Creation Conference was part of those achievements uh, that had been uh, praised. Unfortunately, F Father Salmon is, uh, has been sick over the last weeks and so he cannot attend for the first time uh, our conference. But we um, wish him all the best and we uh, hope to um, Looking, we look forward to, to congratulating him to his uh, 90th birthday in July. Now, a conference like this cannot take place without many, many uh, people um, supporting and helping. I should mention uh, definitely the Alexander M. Haig uh, Endowment Fund for the Science, Faith and Culture that makes uh, financially uh, possible and also supports our Horber students who are attending this uh, conference and we are grateful for, uh, for this uh, support. Um, we have, uh, of course, the support of the, uh, um, uh, of the uh, Associate Dean of Natural and Applied Sciences, uh, Baram Rugani, who introduced our speaker last night, and we are grateful for that. And also he allowed us to use resources, that is, personnel, uh, lovely people uh, from uh, from his uh, uh, department, and especially we are grateful uh, to Jane Beatty, who uh, shepherded this conference and is uh, still shepherding uh, today, and uh, make, make, is making it a success. We are also grateful for Peg McKibben, who used to do this uh, job in the past and volunteered to help with the transition, as well as um, Angela Pond, uh, who was engaged in this. With that, we uh, let me uh, come to introduce our, uh, to our today's speaker, um, Robert Ulanovitz. Um, he uh, gave his uh, uh, he, he gave his first talk uh, last night on science and belief in a contingent universe, and will then today speak about ecological metaphysics, room for creator. Now, um, Robert Ulanovitz is actually a Baltimore kid. Uh, he uh, was born and grew up in, in Baltimore. He is, uh, did his uh, degree, uh, PhD, in chemical engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Then he started teaching at uh, Catholic University in Washington and later became a professor at the um, University of Maryland. He currently is the Arthur R. Mar uh, working at the Arthur R. Marshall Laboratory of the Department of Biology at the University of Florida because uh, having started as an uh, uh, 
as a chemical engineer, he has moved into ecology, and that is definitely the topic also of his uh, talk uh, this morning. So please welcome Robert Ulanovitz. Also, Herr Dr. Blum, recht schönen Dank für Ihre großzügige Vorstellung. Thank you very much. Um, I want to begin, uh, those, for, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, uh, first of all, for those of you who were, to correct two errata uh, that I made yesterday. I tend to confuse three French thinkers all the time, uh, Blaise Pascal, Sadi Carnot, and Pierre Simon Laplace. And I referred to Laplace's uh, all-knowing angel or all-knowing demon uh, as belonging to Pascal. That was an error. Uh, and then secondly, uh, Walter Elsasser, I'd identified as belonging to the Department of Physics at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, Dr. Fisher said no, he's ours, Earth and Planetary Sciences. So. My apologies to any of you besides him who are in Earth and Planetary Sciences. Some of you may not have been here yesterday, so I'll begin with a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a review of just the, the overall ideas that we discussed yesterday. I can't go into any detail. Basically, I was arguing that the ontology of the fundamental universal laws of physics is generally exaggerated, that uh, they're, they're portrayed as being totalizing. Uh, everything is determined by, can be traced back as being determined by the, the, the laws of physics. Uh, and my argument was not that they are wrong or that they are ever violated, but simply that they pertain to a world of simple homogeneous systems and that when you get into the, to the biological and the human world, you have massive, munificent heterogeneity and that when that happens, uh, the laws can no longer specify, can no longer determine. I gave several arguments leading up to that. The first one had to do with history. The idea that the portrayal of the Newtonian laws is often biased uh, and some things are attributed to Newton that really he didn't do. Uh, and that, for example, the algebraic reversible laws Newton actually argued against. I argued in terms of dimensionality when we say that life an evolution is equal to uh, matter moving according to, to universal laws, that this violates dimensionality, that process, life as process, has a dimension of rate, time explicitly, whereas the laws of physics, although time appears, it appears in so-called reversible fashion, uh, so that you can't tell whether you're going backwards and forwards, and that, so that it's essentially timeless. We deal with timeless things like energy, uh, momenta, and mass that are conserved. Uh, I talked about problems with logic. Uh, uh, here, Walter Elsasser, who I just mentioned, uh, uh, talks about uh, Whitehead and Russell, who said that all the laws of physics are reducible to operations upon homogeneous sets, and that when you get into a heterogeneous world, that goes out the window. Uh, so that he could say with rather strong confidence that if there are laws for biology, they will not look like the laws for physics. So you have a problem of connection there. I talked about completeness. We tend to focus on the laws as if they were an abstraction from specification. They are universal, and as such, we always have to, 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 to specifically state uh, what the, 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 the specifics at hand are, and that if we cannot do so, the problem remains insoluble and non-deterministic, at least from an epistemological point of view. Uh, I talked about contingency, the idea that these boundary, boundary value statements, these specifications, uh, could be totally contingent. Uh, not meaning that they violated the laws, but that they are the result of novel situations that could not be described, the boundary conditions for which could not be described in closed form. Okay? Um, 
I, and then, then I talked about uh, uh, there being a whole spectrum of contingencies. We think, normally think of, of chance as being blind chance, but in fact there's something even more radical than blind chance. There's, there's uh, uh, novelty, radical novelty, uh, that uh, I used arguments from Elsasser to defend. And that going in the other direction, there are uh, there are chance that actually has a certain directionality. There are conditional probabilities and there are propensities, things that happen most of the time but not all of the time. And then so forth up on to uh, uh, determinism. And the idea here was that if you could, if you could give uh, specific specifications like, you know, my example was calculating the, the, uh, the trajectory of a cannonball. If you could actually give simple specifications like the location of the cannon, its angle with respect to the earth, its muzzle velocity, then you could, you could solve that in closed form and, and do determinate prediction. But if you had radical contingency as a boundary condition, you usually got radical contingency or, or insoluble uh, problem out, out. And then finally I talked about sufficiency. The idea that there are really very few laws of physics. There are the four force laws, uh, strong and weak nuclear force, uh, electromagnetic force, and gravitation. Uh, and all of these are reversible laws. Uh, uh, you could add on the first and second law of thermodynamics. So, you, you know, six or seven universal laws of physics. Uh, six the, the number of combinations in order to specify things of those is, you know, it's fairly numerous. It's 720, roughly 720, six factorial. Uh, that seems like a lot, but it's really pales in comparison with the number of com combinations that you can get from even a system of moderate heterogeneity. You know, maybe 35 definable, distinguishable individuals. Uh, that comes to 10 to the 40th. Uh, possible combinations, so that for each, each, of, each of the combinations of laws, you have literally millions, billions, uh, at least thousands of, of uh, situations, of, of combinations that will refer to each of the, the combinations of the laws. And while many of those can be eliminated by conditional specifications, not all of them can be. And you usually have a large multiplicity of situations that satisfy that specification of laws exactly, so that the laws are not violated, they simply cannot discriminate amongst the, amongst the many possibilities. Uh, yeah, I've forgotten. Hello? Yeah. So uh, then I went on to say, okay, okay, if the laws don't give us what is happening, what does? Uh, uh, what does specify actual situations? And uh, I talked about uh, I talked about processes and combinations of processes and how some of them are stable. And then I focused on one particular subset of processes: those that are autocatalytic. Uh, they are processes that are self-reinforcing, uh, usually indirectly. Uh, a catalyzes B, catalyzes C, catalyzes A. And that how, when you look at the properties of such autocatalytic combinations in com combination with contingencies, especially radical contingencies, your dynamic is very, very non-mechanical. Um, it, uh, uh, the, the combination gives rise to, to uh, uh, internal selection, so that uh, whereas evolutionary theory always depends upon external elimination, you can actually have internal reinforcement within your system. That's not accounted for by the, the normal Darwinian narrative, although Darwin himself did talk about, did talk about growth. Um, also the dynamics of, of autocatalysis in combination with, uh, uh, with, with with contingent inputs gives rise to, to selection for, for, for those changes that bring more material and resources into the system. So that there's this centripetality, the centrality of, of autocatalytic uh, configurations bringing ever more uh, resources and, uh, and energy into their own orbit. Um, and I, I, I talked a little bit about the autonomy of these autocatalytic behaviors with respect to the laws of, 
of physics. Uh, also, the scenario of contingencies being incorporated into autocatalysis, the idea that autocatalytic processes are always being impacted by a whole host of contingencies, and most of them just don't do a thing to the system. A few of them will damage the system. A very few of them, however, will, will conform with the system in such a way that it increases the autocatalysis, which happens to be an asymmetric process. So you get a directionality uh, out of all of this, uh, out of the autocatalytic system, and that direction is in greater autocatalysis. Um, but the idea is that this scenario is not random because not all of the, uh, of, of the impingent pro events and processes uh, are selected. Most of them are, are not selected, just a very few. On the other hand, those that are selected, uh, uh, usually the one that is selected is not unique. It could have been another one that could have arrived, you know, 10 days, 10 minutes, 10 days later, that would have done just as well, have been very different, and taken the system in a slightly different direction. So you have a situation that is non-random but indeterminate. And then I mentioned Gregory Bateson, the uh, anthropologist, who said that uh, uh, causal circuits, and the autocatalysis is a causal circuit, are capable of taking random input and giving you non-random output. And that's certainly what we're getting here. And I asked you, uh, uh, as you went home last night, to think of, of uh, situations that are, are non-random but indeterminate, because that threw me for a long while. Uh, and uh, I came away, I guess it was resolved for me by what I think is a wonderful, wonderful metaphor, metaphor uh, that, was, that was articulated by John Archibald Wheeler, the physicist John Archibald Wheeler, whom I learned only yesterday, entered Johns Hopkins University at the age of 16, and graduated with a PhD at the age of 21. So there's another Baltimore link in all of this. Anyway, John Wheeler was concerned. He was a particle physicist, of course, as almost all physicists are of, of his, his, his era. And uh, at the time, uh, there was the schedule of possible particles that had different uh, directions, spins, flavors, uh, whatever, uh, and, and that that uh, uh, particles were assigned to a particular uh, element of this big multi-dimensional matrix, and there were these empty holes, and the question was, is there a particle that has this particular, so that the big search was on to find such a particle, and you usually got a Nobel Prize if you found it, so the, the pressure was big to, to do all of this, and, and Wheeler was concerned. Wheeler was concerned because he said, well, are we actually discovering something in nature? Or are we artificially creating a particle? Because, you know, you, you had to build this big apparatus and run it in a special way in order to see something that fit that particular empty hole. And, and so he said that the development of science is like unto a parlor game. A polar, parlor game. Okay, the idea here is that maybe there are a dozen or so of us that are invited to a big dinner. Uh, and... Uh, Dinner is late, so the host or the hostess says to, it, to everybody, please entertain yourselves for, for another half hour, 45 minutes while we get dinner ready. So we say, okay, we're going to play a word game. We're going to play something like 20 questions. We're going to send somebody out of the room. And uh, the idea is going to be that we think of a word, the person comes back in, and the rules are that that person asks uh, questions of the rest of us that have to be answered by a simple yes or no, no explanation, no qualification. And uh, the person keeps asking questions until they guess the word. So let's say there are you know, a bunch of us here, and we, uh, and we decided, well, we'll send Dr. Bloom out of the room. Uh, and we'll, you know, so he goes out of the room, closes the door. And then you have some radical character like myself or something like I said, hey, there is no word. Okay, we're not going to assume a word. Uh, the idea will be that Dr. Bloom will come back in and ask us the first question. He may ask Dr. Domning uh, a particular question, and he's free to say yes or no at unfettered whim. And then to go and he'll, uh, he'll ask, ask Dr. Hellerich uh, uh, a second question. Dr. Hellerich can say yes or no. 
uh, however he wants to. The only constraint will be that his answer cannot contradict to uh, the answer given to Dr. Domney. Uh, and then he goes on and asks Dr. Derry a third question, and his answer can be yes or no, the constraint being that his yes or no cannot contradict any of the other two, and it goes on to Dr. Jostes and the whole, whole, the whole dozen of us and so forth. The game ends when, you know, when Dr. Bloom says, well, uh, is the world, is the word uh, podium? And the only possible answer is yes. Okay? Now, this game is non-random, but indeterminate. Okay, the idea that, that it's non-random, the first, the first answer was random. Okay, but the second answer was not, it was conditional. And the third answer was even more conditional and so forth until, until a word was actually chosen. So, uh, it does lead to a determinate end, but uh, that's in the single case. But if we were to replay the game, uh, with someone who wasn't in on it and so forth, uh, we'd come up with a different word. It's very important because the laws of physics correspond to the rules of the game. They are necessary and they constrain, but they do not specify, they do not determine. Okay, the next word uh, might have been exit sign, I don't know, or, or door or whatever. Uh, uh, they, they function and they constrain, but they do not determine. Uh, that's all very interesting and it's, it's very enlightening about the role of, of physical constraint. But there's ev it's even better, it gets even better than that because we can ask ourselves, what really determines the word? And the answer is, it's a conversation. It's a conversation between the questioner and the respondents, okay? The questioner is trying to build a structure, a logical structure that will lead to uh, a particular end, okay? Whereas the respondents, you know, especially if they're a little, okay, they will try to prolong the game as much as possible by giving answers that will, you know, be a little bit diffuse in, in, in building that structure. So it's really, it's really a, a, a dialectic, it's a conversation. Uh, that the, let me see, that determines, oh, sorry. Um, okay, now, I'm gonna go back to nature. Uh, this conversation, remember the questioner narrows and builds logical structure, the respondents broaden and keep the game going. Remember that, keep the game going, okay? In nature, in nature I talked about these autocatalytic-like di dynamics and it, it builds, they build agency. There's a particular direction to them. Uh, they can work, they can actually determine, uh, determine structures out of contingencies. Uh, uh, whereas uh, this building of these autocatalytic structures is constantly being by bombarded by entropic uh, contingencies that tend to tear it down and, and, and erode it. Uh, entropic erosion, if you will. So that in nature, uh, I'm contending that nature is dual, okay? Not Cartesian dualism, but nature is dual. That like Heraclitus, uh, Diogenes says that Heraclitus looked at the world as the dialectic as, as uh, the result of building, uh, building structure and tearing down. Uh, that's somewhat akin to, to Eastern thought, the Lao Tse, uh, or the Tao, uh, where you have the act of yan, uh, you know, that, that goes forward and creates, and more conservative canonic y uh, yin, so you have this yin-yan dialectic. Uh, Chardin, Teilhard de Chardin, who spent time in China, so it's perhaps no surprise that he would think this way, uh, describes it, I think, even better and even more in consonance with what I'm talking about because uh, he said that, that, that the world is the result of, a, uh, of competing 
convergence and divergence. The neat thing here is that he's talk he talks radially about things coming together and about things going away. Centripetality, centrifugality. And, and I've learned through my conversations with my Chinese colleagues that this is a very common form of, of parlance even in science uh, in the East. Uh, so uh, uh, associated with this dualism, I maintain, to complicate matters a little further, that there are dual levels of causality. And the, the partition between these two levels has to do not with space and time, but rather with complexity. Uh, when you have simple and homogeneous systems, as you encounter mostly in physics, uh, uh, the rules give, the, the, the laws give, give rise to situations which tend to fall apart, okay? Uh, we had uh, 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 Ludwig von Boltzmann and John, Josiah Willard Gibbs uh, talking about uh, uh, how entropy comes out of, of simple models that, that tend to say that the universe is falling apart. Um, then you get to a certain degree of heterogeneity, a certain degree of complexity, and the game changes. Suddenly, uh, it's complicated, it's heterogeneous, and we get, we get the probability, the strong probability of all catalytic type uh, structures and attraction. Uh, it's order building and it's centripetal. It's centripetal uh, in the sense that it, it builds these enduring structures that tend to propagate themselves and improve themselves as much as possible. Uh, and they actually serve as future constraints. They, they, they are what selects the new radical uh, contingencies that improve them. Okay? Um, so that these rules, if you will, uh, Charles Saunders Peirce called them habits. Nature tends to take on habits. Charles Saunders Peirce ended his career at Johns Hopkins. He was thrown out because he had the temerity to write about his Christian beliefs. Uh, now Hopkins kind of regrets that they, they, they let such a, a stellar a man in, uh, who's really at the forefront of current philosophy go. But anyway, uh, uh, my friend Stan Salty calls them laws of matter. Why they're laws of matter, I'm not sure. Uh, I call them proximate laws, okay? They're not really universal at all. They, they pertain to a particular time, place, and history. But they are determining. They are, they are, they are the, the, uh, uh, the dynamic that determines how things develop. Uh, and that is to a degree autonomous of the laws of physics, which still constrain, still necessary, but they don't determine. All enduring forms are a serial history of contingency. Everything that we see in this room which is artificial. Everything that we see out in the woods, out in the forest, out in the, the, the wilderness has a, has a history that involves contingency. Okay? Uh, it wasn't the laws alone that created them. They participated in it, but contingencies are the real way. So that so that if we discover ecosystems uh, and extraterrestrial and whatnot, there's a strong possibility they could be quite a bit different. Now, this has so, thus far been a qualitative narrative, and it's more in the realm of philosophy, if you will. Science demands, however, that uh, nature be subject to measurement and to the creation of falsifiable hypotheses. We must make uh, we, must, we must make hypotheses about nature, we must measure, and that hypothesis must be capable of being falsifiable by the data. Everything that I'm talking about, while, you know, I'm not gainsaying the laws of physics, they were brilliant uh, uh, achievements of, of humankind, uh, uh, but, but, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're limited. Um, uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm not at all criticizing is the scientific meta, method you know, of, of building hypotheses and testing them with data. That remains, in my view, totally intact. So how can we, how can we create this thinking, which as some of you have already noticed, 
is process thinking because yesterday we identified life as process and that we can only talk about life in terms of other processes. Remember I talked about Tietze's deer and all the normal measures of biology were present in the dead deer, but the processes were missing and that's, that's central to, to, to life. So uh, life is process and it's serial transitions between states and some of which involve configurations that are autocatalytic. Now, um, ecology, for as long as I've been alive, 19, well, longer, 1942, uh, over 70 years, has described transitions from one state to another in terms of networks, okay? Um, here's an example of the network of the mesohaline Chesapeake Bay from about uh, Pools Island down to about the mouth of the, the Potomac River that we put together in the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. Uh, uh, I won't go into any detail at all. Uh, you have what are called the plankton. These, these things are tiny things that float around in the currents. Uh, we have things on the bottom that are called benthos uh, that filter things and, and, and the, uh, they create detritus or, 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 or obfo what is it? Uh, just detritus that falls down to the bottom and they feed on it, your oysters, your, your clams and other different. And then you have the necton, the, the fishes that are mobile and move all around, some of which uh, feed on the plankton, some of which feed on the benthos and whatnot. And, and we put this together in a big network. Now, here's the thing about networks and process thinking. Remember, a process is a transition from one distinguishable state to the next to the next, okay? Every pathway in here depicts a process, okay? You can trace, trace carbon as it goes from phytoplankton to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to zooplankton, microcrustaceans, and, and all the way up to you know, your striped bass and your bluefish and whatnot. Every pathway in a network is a process. The entire, con the entire ensemble, therefore, is a configuration of processes. So while I've talked about configuration of processes, uh, we can go out in nature and we can actually quantify uh, each number on here is the rate of carbon transfer of grams carbon per square meter per year, okay? So we can go out and actually quantify uh, the, the strength of these, these processes, some of which contain cycles, okay? If you, if you uh, cr I create an algorithm that identifies the, 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 the cycles, and uh, I won't go into it, Oop. But uh, uh, this really surprised us because we have a whole bunch of cycles up in the, uh, the, the water and we have these other cycles uh, between the fish and the benthos and whatnot and we have these, these strange species that don't engage in any cycles. So we can tell something about how the system is operating in sort of, in sort of a quasi-mechanistic me uh, uh, way. But the important thing is that uh, these all involve feedback, cycling, some of which could possibly be autocatalytic. Uh, so all of the elements for process thinking are, are there in a quantified network. Now, about 1999, physicists discovered networks. And since, since about the turn of the millennium, there's been an absolute proliferation of, of literature on networks. Uh, most of these have been networks that have been very qualitative, okay, they don't involve the numbers and whatnot, and you often not even directional, they're not even arrows, they're just connections and whatnot. But the important thing here is that the, the effort has been to, to describe the various networks in terms of the mechanisms that give rise to them, because this is in the tradition of conventional science. Um, they, they, we, we quanted, there are certain patterns, there are scale-free networks which involve uh, 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 networks that, that, that expand like power laws, there's small world networks in which, in which local, uh, 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 local communication is dominant and whatnot. And the idea is, to, is to, to explain these various forms in terms of mechanisms that can give rise to them. And this is all in the, you know, the well-established tradition of science. 
Um, I say that this is, uh, uh, this is missing a large part of the, of the, uh, uh, of the story. Um, and I, I call upon Marshall McLuhan, who was a media specialist, very popular during the 60s at the University of Toronto. Happened to be a Catholic, as a matter of fact. But anyway, one of the things that he said is that when you have a new medium or a new situation, we tend to be numb to it. We tend to be dazed. And that we tend to always interpret that new medium in terms, of, in terms that are familiar to us. And he gives an example. He gives the example of IBM, the International Business Machine Corporation, who, always, who started out thinking they were in the business of building machines for business, as their name implies. It wasn't until they discovered that they were really in the business of, of processing information that suddenly their company took off and their stock took off. And, well, you know, you can't, you can't avoid it now. Um, uh, and, and I think that's the situation here. That uh, when, as a physicist, we look at networks, we say, that's constraint. I remember I had one lady, who's now the Archbishop of, of, of Lund in Sweden, say, but, but networks are deterministic. And I jumped out of my seat and poor lady, I attacked her and so forth. No, they're not deterministic. They're an amalgam of constraint and indeterminacy. And uh, we can go to a network and, uh, uh, okay, let's, for example, if we're here in number seven, the microheterotrophs, these are tiny little invertebrates and so forth, and they're eaten by about four other species, the, uh, the filter feeders down here, the clams, the oysters, and, so, and uh, I think uh, by the copepods here. Uh, but they are not eaten directly by, by many of the others. The idea being, if you're at any point in the network, in generally, you do not communicate with all, directly, with directly, with all of the other compartments. I mean, indirectly, it's another story. But you're constrained for any number of reasons, size, habitat, whatever, from, from communicating directly with all the others. That's constraint. At the same time, at the same time, if you're here, you don't know whether you're going to go to, uh, to the copepod, the, the next, you don't know whether the, it's indeterminate, I should say, whether the next microheterotroph will be eaten by a copepod, by an oyster, by a myo, or by some other filter feeder. That's indeterminacy, okay? So you have both constraint and indeterminacy inherent in your network. Um, now, we can't really disentangle the constraint from the indeterminacy in any, in any reasonable way, but mathematically, we can measure how much of the activity is being channeled due to constraint and how much, how much slop there is, okay? How much inefficiency, how much redundancy there is uh, elsewhere. We can make that, uh, uh, that calculation. Unfortunately, I cannot go through the derivation. Uh, it comes from information theory. Why information theory? Uh, because information theory, as some of you probably know, is predicated upon indeterminacy. It's usually called uncertainty, but I, I think ontologically we can talk about it as indeterminacy. We don't define information directly. What we define is the lack of information, and we, we quantify that. We quantify something that really doesn't exist, an apophasis. And then, and then we look at how that function changes when, when there are connections in formative constraints between the various uh, 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 actors in, in the system. And that we call information. It's usually in a communication sense, but it doesn't have to be. It can be in, in a network sense. And that's the way I, I, I use it here. Um, uh, you know, don't worry about this god-awful uh, looking. If Tij is the flow from I to J, uh, I have a program that if you give me a network, I take all the Tijs in it, and I run this through the program, and it comes up with a value A, which I identify as constraint. For those of you who know information theory, it's the average mutual information divided by, oh, that should be a divided, I don't know how that get dropped out, divided by uh, the entropy of, uh, of all the uh, things. But, but 
But the, the bottom line is that it gives me a number A, which is guaranteed between zero and one. You can think of it as a percentage. 0 0.4 would be 40 percent and so forth. And I, I claim that uh, uh, that A quantifies the constraint. I call it really the degree of organization. So that 1 minus A uh, I will now identify as the flexibility in the system, the degree to which the network has options, has inefficiencies, has a lot of you know, slop uh, in which to develop. Um, now, we can, uh, we can see this uh, by looking at some extremes. What are the extremes of A, oops, of, uh, A equals zero and A equal one? Well, here in a very simple four, four, four process system, it's easier to follow the connections with just four. Uh, this particular configuration here, there's no constraint whatsoever. If you're at any point, there's an equal probability of going to any of the other three or staying uh, where you are. Uh, so this, this is A equals zero, totally indeterminate. The contrast, A equals one, is when there is only, uh, there is only one input and one output and all the connections are equiponderant. Okay, these are the two extremes. Everything else falls in between. Here you have, uh, you know, there's only two possibilities and here your A is 0 0.333. So the idea is now we can, the, the, the game is, uh, you go out into the field and you measure uh, a network for an ecosystem. You give it to me and I come back and I give you two numbers. One of them uh, is the amount of constraint, the other is the amount of flexibility and the two add up to 100%, okay? Now, um, when I developed this measure, I thought that it would be a good index for what's called ecological, ecological succession. Ecological succession is when you have uh, pretty much uh, a, 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 a dead physical uh, substrate like a sandbar or a sand dune or a new island that up, and it eventually, it, it, it gradually is is uh, invaded by various species and it builds its own ecosystem so that in the end you get a climax forest and so forth. And I originally felt that this would be a good index for tracing succession, that we could look at it and it would, it would, it would, it would rise as the system became more complex and more organized. So that was my hypothesis. Well, surprise for me, it took me about 10 years to realize this, but no, the data did not support that. What the data, that the data showed was that ecosystem networks from a wide variety of habitats, you know, polar, uh, land, sea, estuarine, uh, and a, a wide variety of successional stages all clustered around uh, a particular degree of, uh, of uh, a particular degree of, of organization. Uh, forget about the, the ordinate for right now. The idea is that they all clustered somewhere around 40% constraint and 60% flexibility. Uh, what, this, what this is, I'll just tell you very, very quickly, uh, it's a product of uh, the organization times the, the flexibility, where the flexibility is, is represented as minus the log of the org. But, but the idea is that when it is maximal, the system is most evolvable. The idea is to, in order to be evolvable, you have to have a certain amount of, uh, of, of organization, okay? But, uh, but you also have to have a certain amount of flexibility, otherwise you're not gonna be able to evolve. And, 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 and what the data were telling me is that no, there's really a balance between the two that almost all systems cluster around. I called it uh, the window of vitality. Um, so that what we have on here is a balance between, between order and flexibility. So that if the system is, too, is on this side, it doesn't have enough order and efficiency to, to maintain itself. Uh, it has to somehow climb the hill up to the top. However, if it's on this side, what happens is that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's too, too efficient. Okay, this is, what this is saying is that natural systems can become 
too efficient for their own good. Because what they do, if you keep on sloughing off all of this, this, these, these auxiliary pathways and so forth, and just concentrating on the most efficient pathways, the autocratic most efficient, you become brittle. So that if you have a novel uh, perturbation, you don't have uh, the sort of the, the random, uh, uh, the random, I don't want to say machinery, but the random wherewithal, the strength and reserve to create a response to that perturbation. Okay, so the story here is that is that uh, you need uh, in order to create to create order in organization, you need a certain amount of efficiency and autocatalysis, autocatalysis being a surrogate for efficiency. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that's to, to come into existence. But to stay in existence, you can't have too much. Having too much makes you vulnerable to a reset way back here. Um, so that, so that you need efficiency to create, but in order to stay in existence, remember we talked about the, uh, uh, the parlor game, that the respondents were always trying to prolong the game and keep the game going and whatnot. Uh, and that's what happens. Uh, uh, Buzz Holling or Crawford Holling back in 1986 talked about such systems at the upper end over here as being brittle and subject to collapse, and gave examples of uh, spruce budworm things, system, ecosystems that are vulnerable to collapse. Interestingly enough, I, I, found, I came across, in preparing for this talk, I came across a, a beautiful quote from Teilhard de Chardin, and he was talking about asceticism. And what he said, I'll quote, I'll read, he said, in the spiritual life, as in all organic processes, keywords, as in all organic processes, everyone has their optimum. And it is just as harmful to go beyond it as not to attain it. Okay? Uh, I thought that was quite prescient because, because if, you, if you stay within the realm of, uh, of, of, of physics, of pure physics, you're always concerned with what is, the constraints that exist, the constraints that bring something. And you're not really concerned about what, what is not, the apophatic, uh, what is missing. Whereas in biology, what is missing can be extremely important. Uh, if a predator doesn't have a particular prey, it might starve. If a prey doesn't have a predator, it might flourish. So, so absence is very much an important thing. And I've, I've been arguing that contingency is very much a part of the internal dynamics of biological systems. Okay? Uh, because in conventional, in conventional physics, the idea is you want to concentrate on the uh, constraints and you want to push the noise aside. Okay? You want to it's, it's, it's a bother. You want to get rid of it. And the lesson here is that in the biological system, you cannot do that. that. That it is part of the internal dynamics. And it needs to be reckoned. And it can be reckoned using networks. Um, okay. At, uh, at this point, I want to have a little diversion. Uh, from uh, using this particular figure because I think it's, it's rather interesting and I think this particular audience might, might enjoy it. Uh, John Haught, Jack Haught, whom you all know, of course, uh, talks about uh, a cosmology of despair in science. And, and the idea here is that if you, if you take... Uh, if you take the laws of physics and the second law of thermodynamics, you conclude that the end state of the cosmos is what is called heat death. Okay, that the cosmos will, will eventually erode into a state of widely separated low energy photons. Okay, and you know, all is, all is not, alles hin, it's gone. Um, that conclusion is predicated on models that are rarefied, that are, uh, in other words, not dense, okay, that are homogeneous, all the tokens are the same, and that are either non-interacting or very weakly interacting. They have 
no other alternative but to go to heat death. Okay? It's the only possible end state, and that end state is A equals zero. Well, when you get to systems that can now interact in a reasonable way, what we discover is there's another possible and equilibrium endpoint. It's at A equals one. And if you go back here, you know, it resembles, it resembles a, an equiponderant uh, cycle, if you will. This equiponderant cycle reminded me of the standing wave, the standing wave metaphor from quantum theory. Okay, the idea that uh, uh, the, the stable orbits in, 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 in neutral matter uh, are essentially this wave motion uh, that requires no input or no output normally. You can think, you can think of a hydrogen molecule as being a, a proton and a ground state electron, and that could be out in the deeper recesses of space where uh, no, you know, very few photon, pro, uh, photons ever impact it, and it can just go on in motion forever. I call it a perpetual harmony. Okay, so that, so that uh, the, uh, the state of A equal one represents these perpetual harmonies. Now, there's, uh, there's reason to believe that the universe in its evolution underwent uh, a, a, a dichotomy uh, where, where you had reversion to these two states, and it's called the recombination. It occurred about, about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, which is a long time, logarithmically speaking, after the Big Bang. Uh, and it's the time uh, before the recombination, matter, the universe was still so dense that light could not penetrate very far through the universe. It was it was opaque, if you will. Uh, but the universe continues to expand adiabatically, the energy levels low, lower, and certain, at a certain point, the recombination, light can now make its way through the universe. Uh, some, I think some even refer to it as the Aufklärung, but that gets into the Enlightenment as well. But anyway, well, we have Professor Bloom or, 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 or his wife can, can straighten me out on that. But, uh, but the idea is what we had is that, is that matter was, was indistinct. It was part of what, I, what, what Prigogine calls a, uh, uh, a, uh, a dissipative structure, okay? That, that, uh, and that as the, the energy levels drop, this dissipative structure, which was a combination of photons and partially formed bosons and whatnot, and I'm not a particle physicist, so I can't describe it too well, but the, the key point here is, is at that time, uh, the levels got, and there was a split so that, so that a lot of the dissipation uh, suddenly became what we now know as the background radiation, the 3.7 background radiation. Most of what went over here, some of which at least, became neutral matter, okay? Neutral matter like the matter we have here, it's rather stable at least over a reasonable amount of time. And this neutral matter consists of Essential, well, they're not perpetual because, you know, the Sambo will be destroyed after a while and burned up and whatnot, but, but, but they, they endure for a long, long time. Um, so that, uh, uh, it brings up the possibility that sometime in the future, we might have uh, uh, another such uh, recombination, if you will, if you can think of human society as a dissipative structure, and heavens only knows we're very dissipative, as a dis dissipative structure and we're, you know, constantly losing energy, the world is becoming more rarefied and so forth, uh, at least rationally, I don't know how it would happen, I can't imagine how it would happen, but at least rationally we cannot preclude the idea of another recombination phenomena uh, where we where we, we, we progress towards a perpetual harmony, which sounds an awful lot like Tillyard de Chardin's uh, omega point, if you will, uh, a harmony that, that uh, doesn't need any inputs and outputs, but which is within itself totally harmonious. It's not absolutely motionless, okay, but, uh, but it is, is harmonious. So that's a little, little diversion. 
Um, well, to, to sort of try to begin to summarize everything I've been saying, uh, I'm proposing that nature uh, is, is, a, is a dualism. Uh, but it's not, not a Cartesian dualism, but rather there are two realms of dominant causality. There's the simple realm where you have the force laws are dominant, uh, entropy is very strong, uh, you have determinant, uh, and I'll just say that ironically, ironically, these models that describe this appeared only extremely late in the evolution of the universe. Rarified, homogeneous, uh, uh, in non-interacting systems came way, way late in the evolution of the universe. And yet, that's what we take as our model. And I say it's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a compliment to human ingenuity that we could take such systems and project backward in time and come up with the Big Bang Theory and all of this. Uh, but we always have to look backward, okay? Uh, I'm suggesting that what we really need is a new metaphysics that allows us to go in the same direction as the evolution of the universe. More about that in a, in a, in a little way. Um, uh, on the complex side of things, uh, we have configurations of processes and historical series of contingent events that are, that are indeterminate. I just, uh, no, okay, I already mentioned that, yeah. Uh, these work in opposite direction. You know, one tends to fall apart, the other tends to build up. So that at least at one level, uh, they're posing one another. Uh, but, uh, but they are actually mutually obligate at the next higher level. How so? Well, in order for, for autocatalysis to progress, to grow, it needs contingency. It needs noise. It needs the other side. Okay. Uh, and the other side, as it gets more efficient, actually dissipates more. Uh, it sounds like being more efficient and dissipating more sounds like a, a paradox, and it's actually, it actually has a name, it's called Jevons Paradox, uh, and the idea that per unit, uh, per unit volume, per unit mass, uh, there is less dissipation, but overall, there's more. Uh, and that's true in an economic realm, that's where it's very important in the economic realm. But, but, uh, but the idea here is that at the next level up, these two are mutually obligate. Uh, the Eastern thought has a term for this. They call this deep cooperation. The idea that agonists at one level really need one another at a higher level. And that goes a little bit against our Western way of thinking, but I guarantee you that, the, uh, that, that people brought up in the Eastern way see this immediately. Um, anyway, what I'm proposing is a new metaphysics. Now, yesterday I talked about the old metaphysics. Uh, I talked about it as essentially five major postulates uh, that were current at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, that, that there was uh, a closure, that only material and mechanical causes are legitimate, that there's atomism, that you can pull things apart, study them, put them back together, the ensemble behaves as the ensemble. Uh, that there's reversibility, that all the laws in and of themselves are reversible. That there is determinism, if you give me specifications to within a tolerance of epsilon, I'll give you a prediction to within a tolerance of delta, predictable. And there's universality, the laws of physics we still believe are, are valid at all times, space, and everywhere. Um, so that uh, I'm proposing in this whole dynamic a new metaphysic that has only three axioms. Okay? The first axiom is that of contingency. And what I'm saying essentially is that contingency is ontic, it's ontological, it's not simply epistemological. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, these, these contingent events really do obey the laws of physics and therefore are predictable. I agree with the first part, they do obey the laws of physics, but the specifications required to describe them are intractable, we cannot formulate them. So 
The whole problem is insoluble. So the contingency needs to be dealt with in an ontological sense. And I say that processes can interact with other, uh, excuse me, a system is continuously being impacted by events not amenable to description in closed form. The second axiom is that of feedback. Um, the idea that a processes can interact with other processes to influence itself. In auto, uh, autocatalytic uh, way is one example. It can do it in negative ways too, of course. Um, but that, uh, uh, but that I would like to, to, to stress that this is a very radical assumption. You say, radical? We all know about feedback after all. Well, we know about feedback, yes, and we had our discussion this morning about this, but we know about feedback in an atomistic way, because as engineers we created feedback, uh, uh, feedback systems to control processes and whatnot, uh, and we built them up in a very atomistic way. That's not the way nature comes at us. Nature comes at us in full form with the, the autocatalytic uh, cycles already in existence. Um, this, this assumption violates closure. Okay, it violates this Aristotelian logic, uh, circular logic, uh, and you can't, and, and whereas most of science is predicated on Aristotelian logic, this violates closure rather badly. Uh, it sets the stage, of course, for autocatalysis and centripetality, and I would contend most of the really interesting attributes of life that are now being neglected. Uh, the third one is, is almost by way of afterthought, and that's history. As I said, we need to invoke it in order to have autocatalysis in a progressive way. Uh, Darwin was very aware, and we may hear about this more this afternoon uh, from Dr. Domingsalk, was very aware of, of, uh, 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 of, of history and the radical way that this might interact with, with contempor his contemporary science. He was a staunch Newtonian, and Newtonian is, is, is a misappropriation, as I talked about yesterday. It's really Eulerian or Enlightenment science, and he was very much into that mode of thinking, and it bothered him greatly uh, that his identification of history might, might somehow erode that way of looking at nature. Uh, I don't have a, a reference for that. Maybe Dr. Domling does. Um, so that uh, uh, no history can come from purely reversible laws. Okay, there always has to be contingencies. Uh, the laws are there to support the dynamics but it's the dynamics themselves that choose to build upon themselves and depend on external influences to build structure. Okay, there are corollary notions. Um, the first corollary notion that you can develop with these three axioms as a starting point, you can make the argument, and I hope I've made it in more or less uh, reasonable fashion, that it's really configurations of processes that function as agencies. Uh, uh, you know, like, like the deer, uh, the configurations there, it functions as a deer and does the processes that a deer does and so forth. Uh, and, that, and that dynamics are actually not monist, but dialectical. Uh, and I could, talk, I could talk also about uh, Occam's razor and all of this, if any of you want to talk about that later. Um, all five notions together are what I have called process ecology, and sort of predicated on process thinking. Uh, and it is a very different way of, of viewing nature. Uh, those of you familiar with thermodynamics may remember the theorem from network thermodynamics by uh, 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 Telegan, uh, Bernardus Telegan, uh, because as thermodynamicists, what we do is we define the states and then we define the forces as different in states, and they are what cause the processes to flow. So it's, it's very object-oriented. And what Telegan said, if we live in a purely linear world, we can invert that. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can talk about the, 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 
the, the potentials and the forces and describe them in terms of the processes. That's in a purely linear system. We don't live in a linear world, obviously, but think about what that means. It means that if we look at it the first way, we will see a number of things and describe them. That's the way we're, we're used to doing it. Uh, if we go to the other way, it won't be equivalent, but it also raises the possibility that we can see things in process that we can't see in the conventional way, and that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to, uh, to preach here. Um, so that uh, we get a new metaphysics, and here's, here's the real kicker. This new metaphysics is the antithesis of the old, okay? If you look at it point by point, here, here are the five, the five, oh, there it is, uh, the five axioms of the mechanical world view. Closure, atomism, reversibility, determinism, universality. Uh, if we look at it here, feedback violates closure rather violently. History is the opposite of reversibility. Uh, contingency negates determinism. Uh, atomism we drop completely because we're talking about systems where the components are, are obligately linked in a significant way. Uh, and the dynamics that we get over here is circumscribed. It, it refers to only a particular uh, location of time, space, and, uh, and, and, and I mean, even those things like, like well, DNA and whatnot seem to be universal, really are, are, are contingent. So if I ask the question, uh, can enlightenment physics fill the chasm between uh, uh, between physics and the humanities, or the physics and theology. Uh, and the, the, uh, the assumption is that if we wait long enough, yes, science will fill that, uh, that, that, that chasm using, using our former metaphysics. And I would maintain that no, it cannot. Uh, uh, Jack Hort uh, talked about metaphysical impatience, and he said that uh, people who want to uh, who want to jump ahead, let's say, in evolutionary theory, and, and and jump ahead and make metaphysical assumptions are are exhibiting excuse me meta, metaphysical impatience metaphysical impatience. <clears throat> Well, all I can say is that, hey, the other side has exhibited an awful lot of metaphysical impatience in their demythologization of, uh, of, of humanistic and religious thinking. Uh, ecology at the mesoscale tells us quite a different story. Uh, the laws constrain but do not determine. So we really need uh, a metanoia, a change from being to becoming as Prigogine recommended, from stasis to creativity, from object and law to relationship and process, from Parmenides to Heraclitus. Okay, uh, we really do. Now, the scientific method I, it remains just as it was. We have to create hypotheses. We have to quantify those, we have to test them, we try to try to falsify them. And I've given you an example of a, of a hypothesis to, that, was extated, that, was, that was stated entirely uh, in, in, in absence, uh, in abstraction of mechanism, okay? Uh, and yet it was quantifiable and it was falsified. So as far as I'm concerned, this is legitimate science. Uh, what are we saying? We're saying that actually now science and humanities uh, can reconnect if we have a metanoia and metaphysical thinking. A theology need not, be, need not be extirpated from the academy, for example. Let's take a look now. Let me sort of conclude by talking about the effects that this entire schema has on science first and on theology, as I see it. And so many of you will have... Uh, perhaps different, maybe contradictory, or maybe very new uh, ideas about this. First of all, on science. Uh, my friend Stu Kaufman says that, uh, uh, yeah, 
says that 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 this way of thinking spells an end to the era of physics, his words, not mine. By that, we're not meaning that, hey, physics is going to go out the window. That's hardly the case. Obviously, we need physicists, and we need physics to continue for a full understanding of our word. But what he's referring to is that today, everything has to be referred to physics. Uh, you know, the idea with the Higgs boson and the discovery that Higgs somehow was going to, to totally reform our way of looking at the world at the meso scale. Uh, I don't think that happened, to be honest. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not gainsay in physics, but, but, but there is this disconnect, okay? Um, so that uh, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, physics will continue to contribute to the story of the universe, even to the story of life, but it will not totalize, okay? Um, it also gives you the possibility for the evolution of the physical universe. And as uh, I think Dr. Derry mentioned this morning, there are a number of physicists who are being to, beginning to reinterpret the, evolu the, 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 the development of the universe in more evolutionary terms. Uh, people like Eric Chasen at Harvard or uh, Lee Smolin, I've forgotten where he is and so forth. Uh, Paul Davies, whom some of you may know, a physicist, says that it's a matter of theological faith amongst most physicists that the laws of physics preceded the Big Bang. That, you know, you had the Big Bang and the laws of physics were already there and they were directing how everything came out. Okay, there, there are people like Lee Smolin who are rethinking that and even in my book I, I, I give this as a possibility. The idea that no, the laws of physics actually started as inchoate processes and gradually became more and more solidified and precipitated out of an evolving universe. You know, I think it came out from you know, nuclear first and then electromagnetic and finding gravitation. Others say it's the other way around. But the, I, the idea is that the laws of physics were not there. They were not present before the Big Bang. There's a little bit of, uh, of empirical evidence to back to, to, to support that, uh, not to answer the question definitively, but uh, for example, the alpha fine structure constant of matter has been observed in the very distant galaxies as something very different even with the relativistic corrections. Very di not very different, but somewhat different, measurably significantly different from what it is now. So that even these constants that we talk about uh, evolved along with the universe. Uh, so the law is precipitated. I would also mention that I think that you know, matter precipitated according to the same scenario that life did. Okay, we're constantly given, being given this, this riddle. We have all of this dead matter. How did this dead matter jump up and become alive? And that's, that's a real problem. Uh, and it's a real enigma. And my, pro my, my answer to that is we don't have to go that route. The idea is that, that matter, if you take Eric Chasen's description of how matter came about, it, it, it has the, 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 uh, the elements of contingency and feedback and history. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it wound up in stable matter. Uh, and life evolve under this pretty much the same scenario. So we have these two things evolving from a common dynamic, if you will. It's unnecessary now to say how this happened. I mean, the origin of life is always uh, uh, you know, some sort of warm pond, or if we only get the, 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 the chemicals, the molecules right, uh, if we get the right molecules, then all of a sudden, boom, they'll all of a sudden start dancing. And I call this uh, uh, Ezekiel's vision or Ezekiel's dream. You all remember the prophet Ezekiel had a vision where the dry bones got up and started dancing. And that's what we're expecting of such a scenario. Whereas the ecologist has a very different scenario for the origin of life. Howard Odom said that, no, we, before we could have organisms, we had to have a proto-echo system. We had to have a, a, a situation whereby we had complementary reactions like, like oxidation and reduction in different parts of space and we had to have uh, physical communication or advection between the two 
to set up what's called uh, a thermodynamic engine, if you will, that processes energy. Once we have that thermodynamic engine going, there's no miracle required, really, for a big process like that to spin off little processes. That happens all the time in physics, where you have big eddies that create little eddies and so forth. Um, so that, uh, uh, you know, really it gives, I, I think, a, a very natural way of talking about uh, the origin of life, um, a process narrative, if you will. Uh, we can rebalance the Darwinian narrative, I think. Remember, uh, I said that the Darwinian narrative, I, and, and I can be corrected this afternoon, I'm welcome to be, uh, originally, I think, was a pretty much a balanced narrative between growth and elimination. The idea that you had Malthusian growth that proposed everything, and then you had natural selection that eliminated the, the unfit. Uh, and it was for a long time, not a long time, but for a reasonable amount uh, after Darwin, that persisted. But it gradually morphed into what we call now the neo-Darwinian synthesis, whereby growth has disappeared from the picture. Why? It looks a little too mysterious, after all. Uh, whereas elimination is easier to describe, and it fits better with the, uh, with the cosmology of despair. Um, so that we can rebalance that. We can now begin to talk about, about growth in realistic, measurable terms. Uh, furthermore, that, that natural selection, the eliminative part, is not the only selection at work in evolution. We have endogenous selection, I think, at work in ecosystems, and I think in work, at work in the biome at large. The idea being that, that those... Uh, uh, species that fit best in their own context of configuration of species that best contribute to the autocatalytic nature of this distributed autocatalysis are the ones that are given a boost vis-a-vis -vis those that don't participate. So we have positive facultative selection. That's absolute heresy in evolutionary thinking, but I think it's at work. And uh, uh, I think we need to really uh, pursue that dimension, if you will. Um, uh, in neo-Darwinism, I think we have misattribution of, uh, of causality. We tend to, we tend to give, uh, attribute uh, efficient causality to the genome, DNA. You know, we always say, well, well, this gene causes that to happen, and this gene causes that. It's, it's a way of speaking, of course, but there are some people who take it literally, I mean, Richard Dawkins talk about these things being selfish after all. Um, so that, uh, uh, I think that's a misattribution of causality. Uh, the genome in and of itself uh, means nothing, absolutely nothing, and can do absolutely nothing. Simply, it's a material cause. In the Aristotelian scheme of things, material cause is necessary, but it's rather passive. Okay, what is happening is that this genome exists in a context of processes. There are these proteonomic and enzymatic network of processes that actually uh, read it, edit it, execute it. All the real work, all the real agency is in that full combination. The genome is necessary, of course, but it's sort of like the law, you know, it, uh, uh, well, anyway. Um, uh, it's... Uh, uh, we really need to think of, of, uh, of agency in terms of the whole complex. Furthermore, as far as the, as far as the evolution of DNA, uh, many people believe that life is impossible without DNA. This is the so-called naked DNA hypothesis for the origin of life. The idea is, first of all, DNA has to be created before life can start because DNA is, is present in all of life. Well, there's a problem, I think, with that particular argument uh, in that... Uh, uh, we need memory. DNA provides memory. But, but even Francis Crook said that DNA is so special that uh, uh, it had to come from extraterrestrial origin, which of course doesn't answer anything. It just pushes causality you know, further back. But he's right that it is very special and that uh, the, the, there are a number of us who believe that, that it indeed is the product of early 
stable config life uh, early living configurations and that its initial function was probably something of, of pre-RNA molecules was probably something like energy transfer like you know ATP AT, ATP ADP and so forth was probably had something to do with the the energetics but that over time you know, as it grew it was accepted Remember, ex remember uh, yesterday we talked about uh, Stuart Kaufman's exaptations, where you have uh, uh, something which serves a function in one context and a very different, unexpected function in another. Suddenly, suddenly it was exapted to start to, to, to store memory. Uh, it was rather efficient at storing memory, so much efficient, more efficient that the, the original proto-memory, which remember was the durable, the durable configuration of processes, really lost out to it and was you know, essentially extirpated. So we see DNA in all of life these days. Those that had to depend on the former way have just gone the way. And there's no real way we can prove that, but who knows. Anyway. Um, Yeah, well, let's move into theology because I'm running. Oh, I'm running out of time. Excuse me, uh, but this is this is. I think no. Let him, I'll try to run through this, if you will. Free will. How does this impact upon free will? It's a given. It's an absolute given. I mean, it's part of the. Uh, uh, I, I would contend that it puts the burden of proof back on the determinists, the churchlands of the world and so forth, to say how, how neuronal firings can somehow make their way through five hierarchical levels in the brain, to deter all each of which has its own associated indeterminacy, to absolutely determine thought and choice at the upper levels. You know, I'm not saying that, that neuronal firings aren't necessary, they obviously are, but but it's not determinate. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, creativity and emergence, well, there again. Uh, creativity, uh, emergence was a major problem if you had the totalization of the physical laws. It's no, it's, it's no problem once you, you say that uh, the contingency uh, is true novelty, and that novelty is taken up into the dynamic. So creativity and emergence suddenly poses no problem to the process way of looking at work. There's plenty of wiggle room. Yesterday I talked about Philip Hefner, a very prominent theologian, active, uh, the head of the Lutheran School of Theology for a long while, who was asked in 2000, do you believe in miracles? And he mm -hmm, and reluctantly said, well, no, God just doesn't have enough wiggle room. Well, I would contend, and I think he believes now too, that there's plenty of wiggle room available. Uh, you know, so, so there's wiggle room available for natural creativity, there's wiggle room available for human creativity. There's wiggle room available for divine creativity. Well, we can't identify it because, as I said yesterday, there's this epistemological veil. We don't know what's behind that veil, whether it's just pure stochasticity or whether it's some transcendental influence. Uh, but if that's the case, if there is the possibility for divine action, that also says there's the possibility for the efficacy of intercessory prayer. Okay? Now, I know a number of fellow believers who, when you talk about intercessory prayer, immediately look at their feet you know, in embarrassment uh, because they, they're really... They really are somewhat neo-deists and they really believe in the, the totalization of physical law. Uh, uh, and of course, I, I admit that, that mature prayer should be judicious, mature, and patient. But there's no reason whatsoever to rationally exclude the possibility of the efficacy of intercessory prayer. So pray for your, your, your friends and relatives, as we're ex you know, exhorted to do in Scripture. Theodicy. Uh, here's... Here's something that's going to involve us this afternoon, I think, because Dr. Domning and I have a little bit different attitude on this particular problem, the problem of evil and suffering. I say that process ecology does not obviate the problem of theodicy, but it does give us a different angle on the problem. Uh, 
Remember I said that at the upper level, neither side, uh, you know, building up and tearing down, neither side can extirpate the other without major, major problem. Um, and uh, uh, for that reason, for that reason, efforts to eliminate all evil, we'll just put natural suffering on the side for right now, efforts to eliminate all evil in its most minute forms are going to be counterproductive. Uh, my favorite example is Albert Einstein in the patent office, okay? Uh, you all know the story. Uh, he worked for the Swiss Patent Office. He spent about an hour and a half a day working on patents. He spent the rest of the day developing the theory of special relativity. Now, from, from an ethical point of view, he was really cheating his, his employers out of his time and whatnot. See, a, a petty little evil. But look at the good that came of uh, relativity. Well, maybe not the bomb, but relativity. Uh, you know, uh, if, if we try to eliminate every little form of loophole and, and so forth, uh, we're going to get into problems. We're going we're to have things like Jansenism popping up. It's my unfortunate experience that many of the young, young believers in, in my neck of the woods in Florida are becoming Jansenists. They're becoming, you know, hyper, uh, hyper obsessive, uh, you know, about rules and regulations and so forth. Or even take Baltimore here during the riots. It was criticized about the so-called broken window policy of police, policing in West Baltimore, that maybe we're going a little bit too far in terms of, of throwing people into, into prison for small offenses and whatnot. Um, and for me, again, the parable of the weeds and wheats was absolutely prescient. You can't you can't just get rid of, of all the weeds and expect the wheat to flourish. It won't happen. Uh, now, having said that, having said that, having defended minor indulgence, and here's where we, we tend to differ, uh, I don't think we can abandon normative judgment. Uh, it becomes not a problem of ontology, why is there evil? We can make an argument for why there is petty evil. We can't I don't think, make an argument for why there is major evil. Major, major suffering, but not major evil. Uh, examples of the Shoah, you know, the, the Holocaust, uh, or the Indonesian tsunami. Uh, one is evil, one is natural suffering. Uh, it, uh, uh, it just reframes the problem, and, and I'm sure that Dr. Dami will, will tell you a lot more about that. Uh, I, I guess my issue, and well, maybe my question to him will be, uh, how can we accept major natural suffering without also accepting major human evil? Because centripetality has to be, has to be judged in its context. I'm not, I don't want to get into big relativism here. I'm simply saying that, that uh, centripetality can work either way. That's all I'm saying. Uh, from the good point of view, we have Bonaventure who says that Trinitarian love, this love, uh, this autocatholic love amongst the Trinity, uh, is the basis for all action. I think that's a really good starting point as a process thinker. Uh, Chardin says that, uh, that it is drawing creation to God, that the centripetal love among the Trinity is drawing us towards this omega point, and this, this love of, of God. Uh, and that and that perpetual harmonies represent a, I, I'm going over, can I go about five more minutes? Oh, okay. Uh, perpetual harmonies, this I regard as a divine signature on creation, okay? The idea is that we have uh, the perfect harmony of the Trinity, of the love among the Trinity, and what you have in the recombination and the creation of these existing ma material is, is a signature. It's not, it's not necessarily the Trinity in matter, but it's the signature of the divine basis for all action that still resides in, in neutral matter. Uh, Saint Therese de Cordac, the founder of the Senecal Sisters, had this vision in which she looked at a chair and all of a sudden the word goodness, la bonté, she was French, appeared in front of the chair. And then she looked over the table and she, you know, uh, uh, tableau, I've forgotten what the word is, uh, for, for chair, uh, appeared on it. And, and uh, no, no, la bonté appeared. And the idea was everything she looked at 
was goodness, goodness, goodness. Uh, and uh, so, that, so that what you're seeing, if you will, uh, is, is God, the signature of God everywhere, if you will. I, I, to me, that's a very fulfilling metaphor. Anyway, you can look at, you can look at centripetality from, from the bad side of things, and we're going to hear this afternoon uh, about original selfishness, because as we all know, selfishness is, is a road to sin, and it can be an occasion to major sin and evil, as we know from what happened in the last uh, uh, century, the wars and the genocides there that continue into our century. Process thought in Christianity, okay? Uh, I think, it, I don't know, and some of you can, can inform me better, I think it was the major reason that Chardin was, was silenced because he really was a process thinker and process, thinker, uh, process thinking challenged a lot of, of existing theology, especially Thomism. Uh, and many Catholics remain obligate Thomists, Neoplatonists in their thinking. And I'm not going to argue against that. Okay, so don't. Um, Process thinking is condemned. I've had confrontations with, with uh, rather notable theologians of the Dominican order uh, who said that, no, 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 we can't have process thinking. God is immutable. I mean, what do you mean God is immutable? I mean, we can't have a conversation with God? No, God is immutable. Uh, my perspective is that Jesus lived in a time of a clash between two cultures, the Hellenic and the Hebraic. Uh, and uh, it was the, 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 the vibrancy of this clash, it was the, this clash that gave vibrancy to early Christianity and I think still feeds it uh, today. And what has happened is that uh, later on, about a, a millennium or a millennium and a half, depending on, on, on your religion, Maimonides and, and Aquinas retrieved a lot of the Hellenic aspects of Christianity. Uh, so we have, you know, this, this Thomist, this, this, this uh, uh, Parmenidian view of, of religion. We don't, we haven't really retrieved the Hebraic point. When in fact, uh, when you start to look in, into the Hebraic scriptures, which were pretty much foreign, I know, to Catholics before, not to Protestants, but to Catholics before Vatican II, uh, what we discover is this process thought all over the place there. there, there this, this human divine conversation was very much the order. And uh, uh, my, my, my Dominican friend said, oh, but we all know that uh, this was just an interpretive metaphor. And my response is, well, try telling that to a lot of practicing Jews. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, in, uh, in terms of uh, my favorite uh, is Rabbi Bradley Shavis Artson. He wrote a book called uh, uh, God of Becoming and Relationship. I highly, highly recommend it. My wife and I have read it and I think it's really informed our, 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 our sense of spirituality of, of really putting us back in that discommunication of the human divine. Um, so that, uh, you know, this is sort of ecology coming to the rescue. Uh, okay, ecology coming to the rescue. Here's this conflict between the, uh, the Thomist and the process thinkers. I, as an ecologist, simply don't see the conflict. Why? Because ecologists now, for at least 25 years, have accepted what's called hierarchy theory. Hierarchy theory doesn't have anything to do with the church hierarchy, okay? It just has to do with, with stages of space and time, scales of space and time. And what hierarchy theory says is that, is that is that dynamics at different levels are qualitatively different. That's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the opposite of this uh, so-called, uh, what is it from fractal theory, uh, uh, self-similarity, okay? But, that, but, but the hierarchy theory has been accepted as, uh, as, as by ecologists that it, things are qualitatively different. Well, God, I, you know, can be thought of as transcending all those, those, those realms. Like, it does me no good to just think of God somewhere way, way, way out there. God transcends all of them at the very largest scales, God absolutely is immutable. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Thomism, in my point of view, talks about ends that are supremely good. Uh, but we haven't achieved them. How is it in, in the, uh, uh, the most excellent uh, Marigold Hotel or something like that? 
Uh, in the end, all will be well. If all is not well, then it is not the end. Uh, the, the idea that these are a very necessary part of religious thought. But I don't think it's the totality. Okay? We, have, uh, we have the mesoscale that we have to live in all the time. And that in our midst, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is among you. Not way, way out there, way in the future. It is among you. I think that we need to make more room for process thinking, uh, at least in Christian, it's already in Judaic thinking, in Christian thinking. Um, uh, in order to be able to appreciate and celebrate imminent reality. Uh, process ecology, uh, I think, is a natural bridge between, uh, between Thomism and process thinking, and as well as between physics and theology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, the Chinese have translated a third window, and on the cover they don't have the world view, they have a bridge, because they feel that this way of process thinking bridges Eastern and Western ways of thought. And we've tried to, we've tried to, to publish the Eastern side and the Eastern perspective, and it's constantly being rejected by the reviewers because they're simply not used to this way of thinking. Um, process ecology is already yielding falsifiable quantitative hypotheses. Okay? My early hypothesis was falsified. Many are afraid of quantification. Why? Many in the humanities are afraid of quantification. Somewhat understandably so because quantification was always the first step towards totalization, which they rejected. But process ecology, despite being quantifiable, is not totalizing. There's still room for creativity and for action, human action, divine action. Uh, and it also, while it doesn't totalize, it does offer guidelines, probabilistic type of recommendations for how to, 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 to approach the future in a particular context. So it's worth pursuing for its quasi-predictive views, but it's not totalizing. Um, so that uh, uh, existing barriers between humans and science are eroding with process uh, thinking. Uh, antagonism between science, the humanities, and theology is no longer a given. So I say that God, nature, and harmony are free to resume their fecund conversations. I'd like to end on that in a very Pollyannish viewpoint, but, but I, I won't, and I'll, I'll keep you for two more minutes, just to say that I, I'm not particularly Pollyannish about this. I've encountered incredible resistance to these ideas, and the resistance is simply, it cannot be this way. You cannot think this way. You're not allowed to think this way. Um, uh, <laughs> Many, many rejections uh, in the literature and so forth. This book was rejected by Oxford University Press purely on authoritative grounds. You cannot think this way. It's not a fit book for Oxford University Press, literally. Um, you know, Sagan and Hawking's idea uh, is still the prevailing consensus. But process thinking, as I've argued, cannot preclude God cannot preclude divine action. And that's dangerous to some people. Not all. I will say, I will say that most of the people I work with on these ideas are agnostic or atheistic. So this doesn't apply to everybody. But there is a strong, I don't know if it's a majority or a minority, a strong contingent of conventional thinkers who feel this is very, very dangerous and who, who are vitriolic, literally in their, uh, their tax on it. Uh, Leonard Susskind, whom some of you might know as the, one of the big figures in the multiverse theory, and I won't go there at all, uh, but, but he, he received a lot of pushback. And he characterized the pushback, and he, he didn't say who, said, who, who gave this quote. He just, on, on, on a blog called The Edge, he, he gave a, a criticism that he received from, from one of his detractors, and he said, to quote, from a political, cultural point of view, it's not that these arguments are religious, but that they denude us of our strength in opposing religion. 
I'd like to think that's not the case, but my experience tells me it's still out there. Uh, I see all the time the, the, the movements, the, the peregrinations to avoid certain phenomena that, that common sense says is there. Uh, Sister Ilia Delia, who I know has, has, has been involved in cosmos and creation, is fond of, equo of quoting Thomas Aquinas. She says, to the point that a mistake about creation can lead to an error about God. It's perfectly, perfectly true. Uh, we need to get the science correct and complete, I would say. But when I look at all this avoidance, I can't help but think, in my own biased way, that a mistake about God can lead to a mistake about creation. And I'll leave you on that. And thank you for being such a wonderful audience. I'm sorry that I went over, and I apologize to the musicians. It's fun to see you. Oh, it's
much. Thanks. Yeah, hope that's okay. That's uh, wonderful. It's a beautiful way to end things. Yeah, really yeah, 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 like yeah. Let me put my microphone down.
love was true. I, of course, replied, something here inside cannot be denied. They said someday you'll find all who love are blind. When your heart's on fire, you must realize smoke gets in your eyes. Friends deride tears 
saw me standing alone without a dream in my heart without a love of my own knew just what I was there for You heard me saying a prayer for Someone I really could care for And then there suddenly appeared before me The only one my arms could ever hold I heard somebody whisper, please adore me. And when I looked, the moon had turned to gold. Blue moon, now I'm no longer alone. Without a dream in my heart. Without a love of my Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Blue Silver bells ringing, see winter time bringing the happiest season of all. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire, Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Yuletide carols being sung by a choir and folks dressed up like Eskimos. Everybody knows a turkey and some mistletoe help to make the season bright. Tiny little tots with their eyes all aglow will find it hard to sleep tonight. They know that Santa's on his way. He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh and every mother's child is gonna spy to see if reindeer really know how to fly so I'm offering this simple phrase To kids from one to ninety-two, although it.
it's been said many times, many ways. Merry Christmas to you. Love and joy come to you, and to you your Christmas too. And God bless you and send you a happy new year. And God send you a happy new year. Jealous lover, you're acting so strange. Hey, jealous lover, what is making you change? Hey, jealous lover, how wrong can you be? I'm yours ever faithful, just be faithful to me. I am just as steady as that clock on the shelf. Maybe you're accusing me of what you do in yourself. Hey, jealous lover, I'm telling you true. I know that you're jealous, but there's no one but you. Jealous lover, you're acting so strange. Hey, jealous lover, love is making you change. Hey, jealous lover, how hard can you be? I'm yours ever faithful, just be faithful to me. Could have cheated lots of times, but just couldn't do. I was much too busy, baby, being faithful to you. Hey, jealous lover, I'm telling you true. I know that you're jealous, but there's no one but you.